I want to invite up the wonderful Kirsten McCloyd. Can we give a hand for Kirsten? Thank you, Ben. So for those who don't know you, communication advisor for Rocket Internet, Airbnb, soon Facebook. Yes, very meta today, feeling very meta. I've heard a lot of jokes already, uh -huh. so getting I, in the spirit. I was actually wondering because... Uh, Somewhere on here, I actually thought I saw like the, the M emblem as well, and I was like, how did Mark get in here? But anyway. It wasn't me, it not wasn't yet, me. but I don't what, know. What's this panel about that we're going to have now? So we have amazing guests uh, who will discuss how we can create a European startup ecosystem and how startups, universities, and corporate can collaborate to reach this goal. So I'm really excited, and I would love to invite our panelists to the stage. Good. In that case, you've got a great audience. You don't need me, so I'm off for a quick Coke break. Enjoy. <laughs> Have fun. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. You can come. Also, congratulations to all participants. I'm so impressed uh, by the talent here today. We already talked a bit behind stage, and we all said that in our university days, something like this would have not been possible. So really impressive, and congratulations to everyone involved, the organizers and the participants. I would love to briefly introduce our panelists. Um, on the left, we have Michael Reinhardt. He's the Director for Innovation and Consumer Services at Vodafone. And in this role, he's responsible for the innovation strategy and the direction of innovation management at Vodafone Germany. He and his teams are always seeking new partnerships with universities and other innovators, so you should really seek out Michael later if you want to collaborate. On his right, we have Dr. Marianne Janik. Uh, she is the Area Vice President for Microsoft in Germany. And previously, for more than five years, she was the General Manager for Microsoft in Switzerland. She started her career at Daimler and ERDS, and she has a special, special focus on innovation, trust, and education. Also with us today is uh, Markus Berger de Leon from McKinsey & Company. Markus is a serial entrepreneur and an experienced digital leader. Um, at McKinsey, he leads the Leap by McKinsey practice, where he helps clients to build growing and successful business models. And you might have heard Markus' name before because he actually co-founded some of Germany's most well-known startups, such as StudiVZ, MyHammer, and Yamba. Some of you might remember. <laughs> and then to my left, I'm also really happy to welcome uh, Dr. Peter Körte, who is the Chief Strategy Officer and Chief Technology Officer at Siemens. Um, he's responsible for the corporate strategy, but also for topics such as digitization and Internet of Things at Siemens. And before joining, he worked as a consultant for Boston Consulting Group. I would love to start by looking back. So in the past, actually, a recent report by the World Economic Forum found that when startups and corporates try to collaborate, more than half of these collaborations fail. Why do you think that is, and what needs to change? If I may start, so um, looking at us and as a corporate, uh, it's sometimes even difficult, and I speak as someone who innovates within a corporate, uh, to uh, find people attaching to the ideas and pushing them forward. So you have internal boundaries um, within a corporate uh, setup. Um, and then if you uh, engage with startups, uh, if you uh, try to uh, make your supply chain work, uh, if you try to uh, pay the bills, um, and uh, I always joke, uh, sometimes we pay uh, bills uh, in a longer period than the startup exists uh, as a corporate. So that's something where we need to speed up. And that's something what I try to, uh, to convince my colleagues uh, to really actively engage, uh, to listen. And what we as Vodafone do is really trying to get the both, get, get the best out of both worlds. So internally uh, uh, trying to uh, find the right startups to improve our processes, our products, uh, and also if we find startups uh, that want to co-work and uh, co-engineer with us, to also go on the market together with them. Yeah, if you want me to add, because I think it's about really managing expectation, be very clear, you know, what should be the outcome because we have experienced, you know, if we work with startups that are not at all in tech, 
this doesn't make sense. You know, it sounds trivial, but having this clarity, you know, who wants what, what's the outcome, uh, clarity on the people working together. Also, sometimes the value topic is an important topic, and then the budgets, and then the, the let's call them KPIs you want to achieve together. Absolutely. Let me let me maybe add one thing. And we actually looked at this. Uh, we published a report last year, uh, exactly on the topic. Uh, report is called "You Can't Buy Love." Um, so on top of um, on top of uh, what you said, yeah, which is very focused. I think the other piece I think that's really important is to literally address the elephant in the room. Yeah? There is big cultural differences, and you cannot ignore them, but you have to actively manage them. Yeah? That was one of the core findings, yeah? other than exactly, you know, there need to be very clear KPIs, it needs to be very clear who's responsible for delivering that, what and who is going to follow up, but it's also to address uh, the, the differences and actively talk about them and, and constantly review and iterate and see, okay, how can we actually um, um, work better together. Eh? You know, as in any relationship, you know, you got to be active about it and, and, and work it. Yeah? yeah, maybe I add to this. Um, I mean, I would flip the question actually, and would say half of them do work, which is not that bad. And if you look at what what are those collaborations that do work, is where you have a clear win-win. Yeah, where, where it's clear about where the startup, you bring the ideas, you, you bring the talent, you, you bring the speed that we need. And potentially the corporates, they do bring market access, they bring some knowledge, some know-how, sometimes even IP. But you need to be very clear of who's delivering what. And then, of course, I do agree with everything else. Corporates are super slow, they're super large, they overwhelm you, you never know where to go. So finding the right person, actually, that you really can trust is, is as, as much worth as probably the idea itself. So as a founder, when and how do I know if I found the right partner to collaborate with? What kind of feeling should I have if I'm seeking out such a partnership? Well, I'd say maybe I, I continue there because I, I spoke about the win-win. <clears throat> it really is um, if, you, if you build trust, right? And with regards to trust is you, you need to be very open about what you want to accomplish from the very get-go and have that conversation. And sometimes people shy away because, of course, I mean, as you've been all asked, right? So what's, show us your big tickets, right? I mean, the, the signature customers and so on. But guess what? I mean, those signature customers are worth nothing because they, they have thousands of employees. And it's great that you have a conversation with one of them, but you need to identify the critical ones. And so as corporates, we believe we have to help you identify the right people in our organization that can point you to. And we had a few actually today that we also showed where we directed them to the right organizations and then directing them to the right people. And then actually you can have these conversations. And from there, everything flows. And we, I think we've, we've made a different experience in the sense that we've got a lot of feedback from startups saying, you know, you're completely overwhelming Microsoft. We don't know whom to call. And we've actually launched in preview now a sort of a hub um, th that's, you know, a sort of a digital portal where you can start, you know, looking at what is actually Microsoft, what would be the benefits. So to have this stage one before then, you engage personally, engage country by country, because as a startup, you don't have a, a lot of time. You know, you want to get to the market quite quickly and, you know, big corporations with more time, that's clear. So we're trying that now. That was a lot of feedback we got. We got a lot of things. So try it out any time. Come back to me with feedback. So that's a new approach to make it easier, at least for the first phase, to set the right filter and then engage personally, of course. Yeah, and to add up, I think also you need to really uh, tell what you're seeking for. Uh, previously, uh, four years ago, uh, we had a general cooperation with startups where everyone from uh, handset covers uh, to intelligent network solutions could pop in. Uh, but we needed to, to really focus on specific items. Now with Uplift, we focus on IoT-based solutions. Uh, and we have uh, several pillars on how we work together from early stage uh, to really mature ones. Uh, you need to tell that in advance, uh, make the message clear, and provide this, this hub or uh, inflow point and touch point uh, to be addressed. Yeah, maybe if you could specify what kind of founders or business models uh, are you looking for for participation, and who should turn to you or your companies if they're in the audience? So maybe I start. Um, 
there's two ways of how we work with startups together. Yeah? On the one hand, uh, they are, of course, in many ways also interesting clients for us. Yeah? Uh, so all the way from the very early ones where we have our fuel ignition clubs, as we call them, where we literally sit together with a, a startup, typically on a Friday, yeah? they like today, uh, and, and look at a couple of their most important problems uh, and, and try to address them uh, together. Yeah? And these fuel ignition clubs uh, actually happen around uh, the world in all the various McKinsey uh, offices. And people do it uh, on their own uh, time. You know, we don't charge anything for that. Yeah? So that's one way. The other piece, of course, is then at the intersection where we work with our with our clients, uh, uh, and there it's very much uh, given the breadth of the work that we do, uh, uh, all sorts of, of solutions are, are of interest, and we then really look at you know, what's the differentiating thing that the startup uh, uh, can bring, where this is interesting uh, for our clients, and, uh, and, and we look at where we can make connections, but also clients, of course, approach us and ask us, you know, who are some of the uh, interesting companies you see out there, and that's also where we make um, uh, uh, the connections, yeah. So I can only invite uh, all all of the founders out there. This probably we we'll probably do a bit more B two B than B two C work, but also B two C is is very broad uh, 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 to actively reach out uh, and 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 start to discuss uh, with with uh, people at McKinsey of what the different opportunities are to work together. Yeah, maybe I, I go next. So, of course, let me Siemens, 174 year old startup, if you like, here founded in, in Berlin. Is uh, as as you know, we we are pretty much focused on in industry, really bring this whole notion of IoT to life, which turns out is a little bit more difficult than than in the B two C context. Uh, and there's a lot of lot of things still to be done. So I think it's the very early stage yet. But we also see, apart from digitalization, where it's all about the digital twins and simulations and actually really building not in the design but also in production and then in the maintenance part. Uh, we see a trend towards climate tech. And actually this week, I'm sure you have followed Larry Fink, who happens to be our largest investor at Siemens, um, who heads BlackRock. And he would say, we believe that the next 1,000 unicorns actually are going to be in climate tech. Yeah? Of course, now sustainability is coming. It's very interesting because now you're at the intersection of digitalization and decarbonization, where the, all this stuff is coming together. So, so these are certainly areas we are exploring. And I saw some really cool ideas also today here. So it's going exactly in that direction. No, I, I can really uh, concur with that because we see the startups where we, we feel there is the best connection to us are those who have a model that, that where they need tech intensity. So there's a lot of technology they would need and maybe you know, they're not so familiar with it. So if we look at, you know, we talked about IoT, we talked about the whole sustainability topic, we talk about mobility and there's and healthcare, obviously. So a lot of tech intensity, but people want, you know, to to start immediately their business, but they need the underlying uh, technology. So we see that this works actually quite, quite nicely. So we can really help. And then, I mean, the thing where we also look at where we can then, you know, on sort of our shoulders, help them to, to go where they, they want to go, to other parts of the world, use the marketplaces, or just get in contact with other startups, with partners, and with customers. And for you, as representatives of your organizations, would you also say that from such collaborations you can foster more disruption from within for your own organizations? Because in my experience, it, it can be quite difficult in a big organization to change processes that have been there for years. Um, have you had experience with that? Yeah, I mean, there are certain certain new technologies and 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 uh, certain new uh, skills uh, that just develop too slowly in a corporate environment. And really, uh, partnering and uh, trying to engage quickly to uh, leverage those—that's uh, the that's the reason why we work with startups. So when we were launching uh, a specific uh, augmented reality based 5G case. We needed support uh, from a, a young and eager company to facilitate that and help us with that. Uh, it would have taken double, if not triple, the time if we did it internally. And I think that's the that's the uh, the cool and nice thing about working together with startups to to really make that big ship, as we always called, uh, move faster uh, and get capabilities that would would definitely take longer to develop internally. Yeah, that that makes sense. Um, 
I was also wondering, um, the German startup monitor that just came out this week um, showed that while the conditions for entrepreneurs are more or less recovered to pre-pandemic niveau, um, there are still some structural issues. For example, there are still a lot less females and founders with diverse backgrounds, uh, at least in the German startup ecosystem. Um, what do you think uh, corporates like you can do to, to set an example for this to change? I mean, uh, here in Berlin, we have the uh, Vodafone Foundation, which specifically focuses also on uh, female uh, entrepreneurship. There is F-Lane, a specific program that was really designed uh, for this, not only within Germany, but globally. Uh, also taking uh, Africa, our sub-Saharan operations uh, and, and, and other uh, locations uh, into account. Uh, diversity is one of the, the real big things that Vodafone uh, has always promoted. Uh, we've been part of the UN He for She uh, uh, initiative for a very long time. So I think um, this is something that we really take, take very seriously. So we've actually just published a report um, um, on the, we call it Entrepreneurship Zeitgeist 2030 to actually show Germany what is possible. Yeah, we've come a long way. Uh, you know, I've been in the startup scene for now close to um, t um, t or more than 20 years actually, came to Berlin 19 years ago. Uh, you know, Nivea told me that we would get as far as we've got until now. Uh, you know, I probably, you know, I would have said you're dreaming. Uh? And at the same time, uh, uh, um, a lot, lot more is, is possible. Uh? So um, we, we did the math, uh, and if we, for instance, in Germany get founder activity uh, uh, across all the various, particularly uh, um, you know, d diverse uh, groups of founders, yeah, if we could get that, for instance, to the level of Holland, yeah, which, for instance, sees twice the numbers of new companies, yeah, we could unlock a potential just from these startups that is larger than the entire DAX today. Uh, and that's only in the next nine years. Yeah? And that's not, you know, you could say that's not overly ambitious. Yeah? We don't need to be the best in the world. We just need to step up to the level that one of our neighbors uh, uh, is doing. Uh, and that potential, of course, has to come from more female founders, from more, uh, uh, you know, migrant uh, uh, founders. Yeah? It, uh, and, and I think all of us uh, can contribute a lot um, to uh, help these groups, uh, you know, make sure that the education happens. I think it's great what's what's happening at this event. Uh, uh, all the all the all the new companies that can come from from the universities, because there's so much great tech uh, and, and R and D happening in the universities, but we're nowhere near at, uh, playing up to our potential uh, uh, to turn then all these great ideas into actually commercially successful. Uh, uh, companies uh, uh, and, and what you know whatever can be done there and I think we're, we're on a great path but again as in many other areas I think we can accelerate a lot more and climate tech is for instance one of these awesome areas yeah I think where uh, particularly in Germany with all the different hubs that we have you know be it in Aachen be it in Berlin be it in Munich yeah, we can really lead the development in the world and I think as you say you know I think it, it all starts with schools and university and R&D because if we start not to have enough female researchers at the first time at least for us you know on the sort of more tech type type of the, the of the house I mean there's so much work to do and as a company you know it starts with with us ourselves to to get technical female technical talent into the company also what we see that work works quite nicely is uh, get these kind of mentorship programs in place with startups, so have our own employees working with startups, getting um, also for the, their career some aspiration, changing the culture of the company, but giving back to the startup, and networks are, you know, start to exist where then people work together. It's, it's a slow process, honestly. Am I happy with it? No. Uh, but I think we need to start to do something. I mean, in Germany, we, you know, being back in Germany since a few months, we are great at doing plans, but you know we need to, to start and execute because the plans are wonderful, but you know no, nobody really cares. You've said that it's challenging to get female technical talent uh, into your organization. Do you think that's a structural problem? What do you think the reasons are behind that? Are you not reaching the right networks? Yeah, I mean, we've tried. I think the, the, the thing is that it's just we don't have enough female talent, you know, in, in the tech 
part in our universities. So this is all the mint, you know, all these initiatives we've been doing the last few years that takes time. What we've you now started as a company is taking, you know, anybody basically and, and you know, developing tech talent within the company. So if somebody can have studied philosophy or theology or whatever, they come and then we, we do what we can do and, and, and it works. So even if you don't have any background and there are some really great concepts like Ecole 42, uh, Volkswagen is doing that in, in Wolfsburg, now opening up in Berlin, exactly with this in mind, you know, everybody can learn tech. Yeah, and maybe building on that is, I, I think um, it's, you really have to walk the talk and it takes a village to make that happen. So in our case, we, we of course have that huge disparity too and it's recognized, we are clearly driving towards a more parity, but we know it's gonna take decades actually on, on the progress that we are. If you look at the population from where we hire from universities, usually, I mean, many of you are coming from universities like Aachen or Karlsruhe or TU Munich or Berlin, and I, I've been at Karlsruhe myself, and I remember this very clearly. It was a 10 to 90, right? So, so it's, 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 it starts right there. What we try to do, though, is we, we try to really bring more, more students, actually, early on in, 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 in the schools over to STEM research and, and really getting them in there. And by having our own role models and showing them that, that actually this is actually kind of fun and making go away with the biases that are usually attributed to any kind of you know, subject that you're studying. But, but this is a generational thing, uh, and I really believe it's going to take us a few decades. But, but the good thing is it's really, really moving. And it's like a little bit like the, the whole decarbonization part. Clearly, investors also, which is a good news for all of us, by the way, so when we talk about ESG, the whole social aspect is clearly going in that direction. So we've given us quotas and everything and targets, and I've never, never, ever seen so much, so much power on actually getting this real. So I, 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 I'm very optimistic, to be honest, but lots to be done. And little things sometimes. You know, we, in our big conferences, I don't know if you watched one of them, we have a lot of female engineers presenting. And this is, you know, normally should, but it makes such a difference. So these little things, I think everyone, we can all do it. Huh? So this, it's not rocket science. Maybe also a helpful tip, you know, for aspiring entrepreneurs, when you build your team, you know, that you think about these things, because at the beginning, at the beginning you're inclined to work with people you know. Maybe sometimes it can challenge yourself to, to look elsewhere. Um, that, that's also one of the aspects that uh, if we are partnering up with startups and if I look at the founding team and if I don't see a female founder there, uh, I ask the question, why is that so? And I mean, uh, because I think you need to take the diversity into uh, what you're doing. Yeah. I feel personally this is definitely also thanks to, you know, younger generations coming into the workforce, putting more pressure on these kind of topics. So I was also wondering... Um, we can definitely see a trend. More and more university graduates choose to found a company right after they graduate. But how can a corporate career also be interesting for people who are keen to work as an entrepreneur? And do you need entrepreneurship skills when you work in a big corporate? <laughs> Well, let me let me take that one. <laughs> First and foremost, but, but we but we really love by by and we think in research ecosystems, right? So that is the, the, at the intersection of a university, a startup, and the corporate. Why is that? Because the the, the university usually brings bright talents. The, the entrepreneurs have these ideas, and the corporates have access, right? They they provide market access. They have also some technologies that you can provide and so on. It really depends a little bit on, on of course, what you are looking for. Um, the thing, though, is what, what we find is that um, there's a lot of disruptions even in our own industries. So we, we set up ourselves own incubators, if you like, which we try to scale up if this is the way we want to go. Not everybody wants to be like that, but of course I'm speaking to the audience, understanding that you're driven and you have, you're passionate and you have purpose and you really want to do these things. So we have these kind of things as well. In addition to, of course, really working on very big topics such as autonomous trains, yeah, that you may have seen two weeks ago, a startup can't do that, right? This is this is really 
deep pockets, takes a long time, and, and making that real, however, is, is very, very inspiring. So, so I, I wouldn't say that corporate, in, in a way, right, the way you depicted it, is, is the old slow, slow dying dinosaur. <laughs> they actually, we are working on the very, very big subjects, but sometimes they take a little longer, uh, simply because also um, our customers very often are, are, are quite slow and changing. And Marianne, you laughed when I said, do I have to be entrepreneurial if I work in a big corporate? <laughs> well, you know, I. I think you know we have to because if we look at how corporates are changing, it's all about you know um, you know hierarchies are going down. We're working in projects, we're working in networks, and there's such there's a, this German word that is no translation in English called vernetztes Denken, and that's so important and that's part of this entrepreneurial spirit. So as a company, and me personally, I think it's one of the attributes, uh, together with curiosity and everything, we need this spirit. We need people that feel empowered, that are enabled, that can work in networks, that can work also externally building up ecosystems, you know, across industries. So it's a yes. So basically, don't be scared to be an employee for a while. I think you can be an entrepreneur in all sorts of environments. And if you look at my, you know, my personal story, I, you know, after university, and I'd actually done two internships at McKinsey, but I decided against the consultant career and founded, you know, a number of companies or joined them. You know, so actually, the, you know, companies you all named, I didn't co-found them. Actually, I joined them, you know, sometime along, along the way. Uh, but uh, you know, I literally then made the step back into. Uh, the consulting world, um, uh, um, thinking both, um, you know, and you could call it midlife crisis uh, uh, back then, um, that, you know, no matter how fast I saw the development of the startups, I still thought, you know, we also have to do something about turning the, the big corporates uh, around and really getting them ready for, you know, all the great disruptions that are happening, which is both, you know, a challenge, but also a lot of opportunity um, out there. Yeah, and what I'm now doing, and I think that's, you know, how can you be, for instance, an entrepreneur entrepreneur in a, in, a, in a consulting business, yeah, you can help all these large companies build new businesses and scale these new businesses. Yeah, and that puts me in a position where I can now literally on a, you know, every six months I help a new client uh, build new businesses. Uh, so in many ways, yeah, I probably do more entrepreneurial work than I've ever done, uh, really on steroids, uh, working with, 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 uh, with the best people. Uh, so I've, and that only shows uh, that I think you, you know, we can all define our own entrepreneurial uh, and environments, and I think all, all of the you know companies here uh, are, are great environments for embracing that change uh, and, and building on, on on the opportunities that technology brings, but also the challenges that we face uh, as as humanity. Uh, uh, you know, if you talk about climate, or if you look at if you look at COVID, uh, um, you know, the, the huge challenges. But as humanity, we can a a address them if we all work together, and it will only be done by entrepreneurs. Nobody else will do it. It has, it has to be entrepreneurs. Quick follow-up uh, as an outlook for the participants. What is the common question that people ask you, you know, as an experienced founder? Is there a similar question that mo every client asks? I think the core question I think that all clients ask is how do you build the culture? That, uh, that and, and or address, you know, you can call it the governance or whatever, but that really drives uh, uh, experimentation, MVP type of thinking, uh, uh, fast, fast to market. I think that's one. The second question that I always get is, how can you scale whatever is whatever is there? And I and also as a startup founder, I can say that is the hardest part. It's the it's the part where most of the value is created. Yeah, everybody thinks. Founding a company, setting up, delivering the first MVP. Guess what? I would say that is that's the easy part. Yeah? The tough part is get to product market fit and scale the company. 95% of the value uh, of most companies that are being built happens actually in that stage, uh, uh, and that's really the tough part that everybody is struggling with. Yeah, maybe I can build on that uh, because we have our own accelerator within Siemens, where we have our internal startups, a lot of good ideas. And what's fascinating is they go through a program which, which is three months and we really ask them, test your idea, that, which usually they have tested with four or five customers, with 200 customers. And they would say, you're crazy, why would 200 customers? We said, just go and, and check and check and check. Not, every, not a single one out of 90 that we had in the last three years was coming out with the same idea that they went in. 
So, so truly, customer testing, customer testing, customer testing, really adapting, learning, adapting, learning, adapting, that's the key thing to make that real. And I 100% I agree, actually. We've already reached time. Uh, I would have loved to ask you even more questions, but to close this panel, um, we wanted to talk about the ecosystem, and I think we developed a lot of great ideas. For one, I remember everyone can learn tech and uh, test your product with customers. I think two key learnings for me. Um, but looking ahead, obviously we are building a great network here. What do you wish um, from the European startup e ecosystem of the future, or if you could complete this sentence, a successful European startup ecosystem requires? We'll just do the round. It requires the right partners uh, at equal level. Requires the, you know, the intentional support system that is being built and nurtured. I was going to say the same. Yeah, I think the entrepreneur, very literally. Yeah, I think both the courage, uh, but uh, but also the right support and mentorship, uh, really helping and coaching each other. Yeah, look at the what are the commonalities? How can we do things? Uh, together, rather than focusing on you know who's competing, who's taking away what what attention, but what are the opportunities to do things together? And I'd say it requires you. Yeah, it requires that network of universities, corporates, startups. I really give you big kudos for all the courage that you put into it, and uh, this is just awesome. So best of luck with all your great ideas. Thank you so much. I think the panelists will be around if you guys have any more questions, so please don't hesitate. And thanks, everyone, for coming and for listening. Thank you. Thank you.